There you go. It failed again. What happened? Well, I trained this machine learning model in Databricks, mm -hmm. and when I deploy this model, the model is behaving totally different than what I saw when I was training the model. So the performance is not as good as what I saw in validation step. And I checked data, data drift, model drift, everything, but they're still not sure what is the issue. Actually, I checked the codes and I think I figured out what is the issue. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. Okay. When you have the data coming from data source for training your machine learning model, you certainly do some featureization and pre-processing steps to prepare the data needed for training your model. Okay. But when you deploy the model, your model is expecting similar featureization steps and similar feature types, schema, and structure for the time when you deploy the model. Mm -hmm. And that means all those featureization steps should be re-implemented again by data engineers for inferencing time. And look, okay. there is a high chance of inconsistency or skewness between the code and the data used for training versus inferencing. And that can cause issues and the failure of your model. Okay, then what is the, what is the solution for it? Well, if let's say we had a pipeline here to fill these two glasses equally, mm -hmm. we can certainly do the same in machine learning project with features. I mean, we need feature store to have a proper and consistent featureization steps mm -hmm. for both training and inferencing and also being able to share these features among multiple machine learning projects or multiple data scientists, so have a centralized place. Mm, can you then show me how can I create feature story and use it in Databricks? Sure. And I'm guessing you want to join us as well, right? If yes, then let's go. Hello everyone, this is MG and let's check in this video that how we can implement and use Databricks Feature Store as a centralized feature repository solution to be able to share and discover available features across your organization for multiple machine learning projects and also being able to making sure that we will have the same computation code for featureization in training and also in ferencing time for our machine learning models. Let's check it out. All right, here's my Databricks notebook. I have already created a Azure Databricks workspace. I gave it a name, I called it Feature Store, but whatever, you can use yours. It's just a demo for me. And what I have added in this notebook and by the way, I'm going to add actually the link of this notebook in the video description part of YouTube. So you can click on it, import it to your Databricks workspace and, and utilize it. But I have added some specific things to this notebook to explain you what I'm doing actually in this demo. So as you know, Azure Databricks by itself come with MLflow. So there's a model registry section that you can register the models, track the model experiments from dev to production. And also it comes with feature store. If you want to understand a bit more MLflow, how it can be used for machine learning operation or MLOps from dev to production and using CI CD pipelines, which I use GitHub Actions, make sure you check the video of Databricks MLOps with GitHub Action. I will add this video on the top right side of this video and click on it. You will certainly will have a better understanding of what is MLflow, uh, how it can be used for tracking the model status in the project, again, dev, staging, production, how you package it, deploy it from there, so on and so forth. So I'm not going to explain MLflow, but we're gonna mainly focus on feature store that actually can be integrated with MLflow. When we create a model, we wanna deploy a model, that certainly needs some features in inferencing time for batch or real time. That's the time that feature store can talk with MLflow. So this Databricks as well comes with MLflow and feature store. So if I switch the workspace to machine learning, you can see the feature store is there, model section is there. But what I'm gonna do, 
I don't want to actually use the ML flow for registering models and also the feature store for registering and creating the features, features of this workspace. What I'm going to do, this is exactly what I did and I'm going to explain what does that in here. I already have a separate Databricks workspace. Um, again, if you check Databricks ML Ops videos, I created this workspace for that video and I call that Databricks model registry. Let me actually open it for you. So that's uh, another Databricks workspace. And you can see here, the name is Databricks model registry. That's a different thing, different Databricks workspace. So going back to the other Databricks workspace, which is feature store, what I am doing, I want to create the features and create the feature tables and register the models all in the other Databricks workspace, which is this one, because I want to use this Databricks workspace as my remote feature store for rest of the Databricks workspaces in the organization. Also, I use the model registry of this Databricks as a remote model registry for all the other Databricks workspaces across the organization. So what I'm doing is trying to choose one Databricks just for model registry and just for feature store as a centralized solution. And rest of the Databricks workspaces, let's say in dev, can interact with it of course with respecting to the permission and access control to create the features and even deploy or create the models so in order to get connected from these data bricks to the feature store of the other data bricks that i showed you and also even the ml flow of the other data bricks that i showed you you need to follow these steps so what i did so you can you need to run CLI commands. You need to install Databricks CLI. If you want to know how, just to pip install Databricks CLI, then you can interact with Databricks CLI and run the CLI code. But even a simpler way would be using Azure Cloud Shell. Because when you actually open it, Databricks CLI is already installed and you can execute your CLI Databricks codes with no issue. And actually I use this terminal to do that. So what you need to execute here, here are the steps. First, you say Databricks configure token. What does that mean? You're saying that, hey, I'm going to use Databricks CLI to connect to a Databricks. And it's going to ask you, okay, which Databricks you're going to connect to that? I want to connect to the Databricks that I am developing my features, which is here, this notebook. Why? Because I want to connect to this Databricks and store the token workspace ID and the host or URL. These are the information of the, da the other Databricks workspace that are gonna store my features there, which is this one. So you need to come to this Databricks that you wanna host your features there, host your models there, create a token. You know how to create a token. I explained in the other video. You should go to setting, user setting and generate a token, copy that. And, and you need some information from the URL of the workspace. On the top of your browser, you can see the URL of this Databricks workspace, just copy that. And that's how I did. So I say that in, when you Databricks configure token, when you add it here, you should say that I wanna connect to my Databricks that I'm developing the features, which is basically here. You copy the URL from the top with the workspace ID and everything, and then paste it here. And then, it will ask you, okay, you want to connect to this Databricks workspace that you're creating the features, uh, give me a token. You also need to create a token here, the same way I showed you, you enter it. Then you say that I want to create a secret scope to store the token of my feature store Databricks to actually store them inside this dev Databricks. And then the workspace ID and the host. That's it. And these are based on your, a part of the URL of your Databricks that you're storing the features. So with doing so, now what I'm doing, I want to say this Databricks workspace that, hey, instead of using the MLflow and feature store of this Databricks, connect to the other one. And here are the credentials that I have added to this Databricks. So you will have access to the token of the other Databricks. You know which Databricks I'm talking about because you have the host and this is the workspace ID of that Databricks. Again, all these steps should be one by one executed in Cloud Shell or any shell. So now how you do it, you say that here is the feature so that I'm gonna get connected to. 
and here is a URI so the URI is coming from here and why feature store feature store what does that mean these are actually the prefix and the scope name of the secrets that I store the, the credentials of my feature store data bricks how here's the scope name I chose feature store that's why feature store came here and the prefix before token before workspace before host these are the prefixes and I use the same name that can be another thing so that's why prefix and the scope name and prefix are both the same that's why you have both prefix prefix and scope name coming feature store feature store that's it and I want to use the same data brick the same remote data bricks for not only storing the features but also registering them the models using that ML flow that's why for the model register URI as well I'm using the same thing and done after I executed this before recording this video now everything will be stored in the remote data bricks as a centralized feature store what we're gonna do dealing with a very famous yellow taxi fares NYC data it is just an, a very well-known example of data bricks and in general data science that's a very popular one what we're gonna do we're gonna predict the fare the fare amounts using two set of features that we create from raw data the taxi fare raw data has some pickup time drop pickup data drop off data I mean passengers drop off and what I'm doing I'm, I'm gonna divide these on two sub features call it pickup features and drop off features just basically distinguishing the features and as you might know Databricks feature store specifically for offline it is storing your data in Delta tables because Delta table is a very unique format of files that Databricks use that has the acidic transaction features you can have time in travel uh, you can go back to the previous version of your tables and they have used the same format which is called Delta for even features at feature store that being said we can even have travel to the back versions of the features to figure out what has happened over the features of the of the features that we have in feature store so that's why the Delta logo is here and you certainly need a database to store these flying features or tables so that's why you have to create a database that what we're gonna do in Databricks we call it let's say fares and inside that fares database we have a feature table called pickup and inside the same database we have another feature table called drop off and we calculate and create these based on some featureization pre-processing steps and we generate let's say model and we register the model model registry and at the same time in MLflow we say that hey this is a model we created and for creating this model we use these features and that's why MLflow can capture both so we have a unique solution that we can have visibility on what features we use and what model we created using those features because we have the MLflow layer on the top of the feature store now that's the time that we're going to compute the features so just simply we're going to read the data using Delta format it's coming from Databricks data sets and we display the data you can see here are the, the main features and this is what we're going to predict which is the fair amount based on the pickup zip code the location the type and drop off and the time for both respectively so what we're going to do again we're going to create two subset of features pickup and drop off here are the some helper functions to do some pre-processing for example we're going to detect if there it's a weekend the time that we had the, the we had the passenger with the taxi we're going to return the partition id needed later on we're going to filter based on the given start time and date time of the data that's it we give it a start and end date and we filter the data frame so I executed this just before recording the video so we can quickly go through it and then here is a custom featureization code that usually we do in any data science project we have to do some transformation over the data and here I'm doing the same with defining them as a function for example uh, I call it pickup features function and now you need to do some filtration based on the given start and end that we just talked about creating for example the the zip codes and grouping by aggregation and even changing some of the types of the columns with let's say converting to float integer and returning so we did this for the pickup feature and we defined similar function for drop off feature that's the second sub feature that we created and then we return certainly the final outcome 
And now we have this. This is the time we apply these featureization steps or transformations over the data. Hey, this is the raw data with the given column. This is the start and end. Apply pickup feature functions that we've specified on top. Similarly for drop off. And now we have the features created for us. Let's display the first one. You can see that now we have the zip code and some aggregation of the fares. For example, within the window of one hour, we calculate the mean of the fare. Which, I mean, the, the price for the mean, the mean of the price for that given travel within the one hour window. This is the time that we can now store these features in feature store. Again, in order to do that, first we need to create a database to store those features. So we're just saying that create a database if not exists, feature store tax example. Execute it using SQL. All good. Next one is creating the table or feature store. Where that F is coming from? Remember, we already defined it on the top. Go all the way back. My FS object or feature store is coming from a remote feature store in another database that we defined that using secrets and CLI that we executed. So now we know what FS, FS is referring to. Uh, coming back, there you go. So we have two features. First one was the pickup. We say that go to this database that we created here. Create a feature inside and give it a name using this data frame, which is Spark data frame, and give it a key. We need certainly key to, to look up these features later. Or when you want to merge this feature with another feature, you need to know what are the primary keys, right? So here, for example, the zip code and TS has been specified for the primary key. The same thing for the other feature, drop-off feature, using the same database, similar. Uh, keys and here's the data frame here is the column that i'm going to partition let's say based on the given date and we can have a description for them i execute it done now i have the features stored in a feature store that is not in databricks in another databricks because i i ran it more than one time it was telling me that hey the, it's already exists which is fine now that's the time that we can interact with these features in feature store let's say i'm going to update this feature we certainly need to have the most updated features for our data scientists to do their workflow right we don't want to have an outdated features then how we can update it here's what we're going to do and when we say offline feature store what does that mean offline feature store is for the time that you want to have your batch workload let's say when you do training you need batch load of data to train a model or when you do batch prediction, let's say you want to have 100 rows of data and for each row do the prediction with the model you train. So you don't need real time, it's just a batch input. You give that, give that 100 rows of input in a batch load to the model and there's a batch prediction coming in out of it. So for doing that, you don't need to deal with very low latency, high, um, high speed, real time serving. So it's just an offline store and that's why it is not using any SQL database here. It's just using Delta table uh, as a file format in an offline feature store. That's it. Now we're going to update this. How? Let's say this is the raw data. I'm going to apply some data from raw data to the features that we already created, right? So we say that, hey, pick up these features, which is pick up features, grab it from the feature store. And I want to update this feature store with the given raw data that I have. So what is the raw data? We say that, hey, this is the raw data. I want to do some featureization steps. Remember, this is a function that does the featureization. And then based on the given date and time and the column I'm saying, do the featureization and retrieve the new updated feature. Now, add this feature to the feature that already exists to make it updated. This is how we're gonna do it. We say, hey, feature store, I'm going to write a table inside this feature store database over this feature table using these new features in a merging manner what is merge mean i mean i'm not going to rewrite previous features i want to merge this new data to the current feature that i have what are the other options you can even do overwrite that will totally replace your features 
Now imagine that code need to be executed in an automated manner. I'm going to update these features every day, every week, every month. How we can do it? This is the best sign that we can use jobs in Databricks. So if these pieces of code can be automated with new data coming in all time, you can have your features keep getting updated, updated automatically using just, let's say, a merge mode over the features that you have specified. That's it. So moving forward, I can even use SQL as an example here to interact with my features in Feature Store. I'm doing some sum aggregations from the dates database that has these features and grouping by showing the results, right? So before going to Feature Store UI to show you that we have created these features in Feature Store, let's actually train a model using these features in Feature Store and see how these two can interact with each other using MLflow. So what we're going to do, again, using these two subset of features that we created to train a model to predict first, right? So I need to create some functions to do some, again, pre-processing and even training model. For example, this one just round the, the timestamps. It doesn't matter, these are just examples and I'm sure based on your use case, they can be much more complex or different, right? Rounding some data and returning the value. And there is another function I'm gonna use later to do the prediction. So when you train a model and register it in MLflow, you can have multiple versions of your model being getting created in MLflow. So this function will give me the latest version of that model that has been registered for predicting the fair because I might have multiple models for predicting the fair and I'm gonna give the, retrieve the latest version because assuming that's the best one. You can specify any other version here and saying that, hey, from that remote data bricks that I'm using model registry there, grab the latest model and retrieve it back to me so I can do the prediction. Let's keep this function and we will call it later. Now, I have the raw data. I do some rounding, some pre-processing. We specified the, the, the data there. And what we're gonna do for training the model of course, we're gonna use those two features that we created, plus some raw data for training merged with these two. Why? Because maybe you don't have all the features in Feature Store. You have a new data or raw data that has some features you're gonna use. Or the label that you're gonna train and get the prediction is not inside your Feature Store. It's coming from actually your raw taxi fare data. And there you go, the fair amount is here. This is what we're gonna learn, which doesn't exist in, in my feature store. So I need to merge these two from the keys that we specified, which was one of the most, for example, zip, to create my training data. There you go, let's see how we can do it. I'm saying that I need to have the first two features. I need to pick them up from feature store, from remote feature store. So I'm saying that pick my pickup feature, pick my drop off feature, and with given feature name and lookup keys. Now I have them. And I want to create a da training data set using two features plus the raw data. So I start the MLflow run to, re to basically log everything. And then I'm going to say that, hey, feature store, I'm going to create a training data set using the taxi data, which is here, plus these two features from feature stores. Let's see how we define it in, in here. So using taxi data plus the sum of these two, I wanna merge these two, and here's the label that I'm gonna predict that is coming from this data, and there are some columns I'm gonna execute them, exclude them, sorry. And that's it, then I'm gonna load this training data set as a Spark data frame to give it to um, scikit-learn for training the model. This is the data set, or sorry, the data frame that I want to train the model, and this is the fair amount that I'm going to predict. Here I'm using light GBM, it can be anything. I'm converting the data frame to Pandas to be able to get it to scikit-learn. With MLflow, I'm logging everything, splitting training and test data, some hyperparameters, training the model, and we're going to lock the model in MLflow of the remote data bricks, not these data bricks. I say, hey, feature store, look, interesting i'm logging the model with mlflow but at the same time calling feature store so these two are talking to each other hey feature store log the model this is the given model with the artifact path actually that's the way i want to package it with the flavor of light gbm with the given training set 
and give it the name for my model. This is the interesting part. Now I am giving more information to my MLflow to not just lock the model, but also let the MLflow know what features from feature stores potentially I use for training set. Because when I specify the training set here, it will go all the way up to figure out what is training set. Let me show you if you do, if you remember training set. Uh, okay, let me go down. There you go. Training set is referring to the feature store. So that's see you see how feature store and MLflow came together. And that's it. Then you have locked them all, locked the model with the feature store. Now we can call it for doing the batch inferencing. How you have the input data that you want to do the prediction over it. Here are the columns that these are the features you use for training. So you want to have the same thing for prediction. And when you have the data, you just call the model using the model URI from MLflow. And interestingly, you say that I want to score using the, this model over this data to predict the fair inside this data with retrieving it from the feature store. Why? Because feature store knows what featureization steps was being done to train the model. And now when you do the prediction, you have to do the same featureization steps. You have to get the, for example, fair data, sum it with this one, merge it with this one, and then create the inferencing data, which before was training data, but here we need same features for the model to do the prediction. So you can see with just referring to feature store, feature store knows my pre-processing and featureization steps. So I'm using the exact same transformation pipelines now even for inferencing, which I use this tree for training, if you remember here, which was the same concept, this tree. And now I have it here for inferencing to create my inferencing data and do the prediction. And I didn't duplicate any transformations here. I I didn't copy and paste the code and I don't even need my data engineers to recreate my transformation codes again to do the prediction. Now I haven't shown you the UI of this feature store. Let's see what happens when you create these models and features. Let's see, I'm a data scientist. I want to know what features are available in my organization to, to retrieve some of them to do another use case, for example. So features and models are not stored here. They are in another data bricks, the remote data bricks that I use. So let me go there. That's the new or the other Databricks workspace. This is called model registry. Let's go to feature store. There you go. You can see I have two feature table, drop off and pick up. And it is telling me that these are coming from these databases created by me. These are the source. You can schedule to update them. I already explained that. I haven't done that yet. I, I did it actually one hour before recording this video. And let me click on one of them to show you. Like with clicking off them, you can click on the workspace. It will show me the notebook that I use for creating these features. So I have traceability. It can give me the name of the features and their types. And interestingly, it's telling me that, hey, I found some models, which is called taxi fair prediction, for example, that was being created by this notebook and used these features. So now I'm curious to know, and you can see by the way, the permissions for accessing this table. I want to curious to know what model was being used using this feature. Clicking on that. Now I am in the ML flow, which is basically here. And interestingly, I, can, I figured out there's a model registered here. I can go to the source. And right now, you can, even I can deploy the model for batch inference in real time. So I was able to have the end-to-end -end lineage and traceability of features to the models. There you go. I came to the models. Taxi model is here. There's just one version of it. And I have all the information about this model. Let's check the version one. You can have descriptions here and you can even change the model to staging or production. And again, the rest of the ML flow stuff that I already explained in Databricks MLOps video. So that's it. We were able to, again, Grab the raw data, create some features, store them in feature stores, and train the model using features from feature store to log them and create the features in the remote data bricks. And when we deploy or log the model, we at the same time have the features beside the model from feature source to figure out what features, what model has been used for that specific use case and train the model. And even for inferencing for the batch prediction, 
I was able to refer the features from feature stores to do the featureization steps in inferencing time. And we just did for batch. Same thing can be done for real time prediction. But for real time, the place that you store the features, if you're using Azure Databricks, will be Azure SQL or MySQL. Because for real time, that's a different scenario. You want to have low latency, one by one, having all data coming in real time to do the prediction. But if you use, let's say, Databricks in other cloud providers, on backend, there would be other database and servers to host your real time server of features. But the concept would be definitely the same, just the application would be different. That's all. We hope that you enjoyed the video and hoping that now you can save your time and costs in your machine learning projects through leveraging Feature Store in Databricks. See wait, you. wait, wait. It's my turn. Okay. See you next week.